So we have time for uh, questions. Um, please state your name. Uh, Shafiq Samani with the World Bank. Just a couple of different questions, which is I know people have actually mapped coastal bathymetry with remote, optical remote sensing data by just looking at the bands. Has that been used to, I guess, map rivers or potentially the bathymetry or depth? And I guess the second question is, and this is from what I've been reading, uh, let's say out of floods, is, which is they've actually used in-store data to uh, determine water surface elevation. And could that also be applied to streams as well, just to see what that water surface elevation is? So um, INSAR has been used to measure water surface elevation. For example, in the Everglade, um, you can track changes in the water over time. Uh, I don't think it is feasible for a river as of now because of the motion. Uh, the water surface has to be relatively... I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do that. Um, you have to have uh, emergent vegetation in order to map water yeah. surface change with NSAR because you have to have double bounce scattering. And so it doesn't work in open water, so it won't work in, uh, in rivers. It works in swamps where you have emergent vegetation. And regarding the bathymetry, um, I, I'm, I don't think there's been any, I, I'm not familiar with anything that's been widespread for river channel bathymetry um, with the, the various remote sensing products you talked about. I know ISAT 2 that's flying now, um, or, or did it, I, I haven't used the, it, it, it's up there, so we've got some data. There's a particular band on ISAT, too, that can penetrate water up to, uh, I forget the depths they're talking about. But again, the challenge with that is the, the clarity of the water. So depending on the sediment load, you, you can't see through it. But if you have clear water, ISAT, too, will actually go down, I forget the number, um, multiple meters uh, to, to potentially get some of that. But I, there's a lot of places it's not going to work because of the sediment loads. Question for uh, Burke. Um, you didn't talk at all about possibly um, uh, deducing flow phenomenon using uh, this uh, Sky TEM. Or, um, I think I've seen in the Paradox Basin along the Dolores River a uh, Sky TEM study where you could see uh, saline water discharge along the Dolores. Is there, um, are you optimistic about? maybe mapping saline discharges near the surface? Yeah, so, so to clarify, SkyTem is one flavor of airborne systems, many commercial systems out there. Um, what we see, there's two primary controls on the electrical properties that we measure. One is geology, and that's what I talk about. The other dominant one is salinity. So we've used this in the Everglades. So that was one of the earliest studies in the early 1990s to map seawater intrusion in the Everglades, and it's it's a dominant signal. It stands out and actually overwhelms the geological signal. Uh, you're right, in the Paradox Valley, we've done the same thing, looking at saline water, same thing in uh, the southern central valley near Bakersfield, looking at saline water uh, near the, some of the oil and gas fields. So those are two factors that are relatively easy to get out. Um, I also work a lot in Alaska where we can, we can distinguish frozen and unfrozen ground, so permafrost versus thawed ground. Uh, causes a significant uh, control on resistivity. One of the things that we generally don't see, though, is water itself, unless it's saline. We generally see the structures that may hold water, but we often don't see the water itself. So I have a question for Ed. Uh, SWAT elevation accuracy is plus minus 10 centimeters. I think that's a little too coarse, wouldn't you think? I mean... You know, in a, in a day you may have at the peak of summer evaporation 10 millimeters a day of evaporation. So 10 centimeters seems too much. Uh, well, that's the, yeah, I mean, 10 centimeters, that's, but that's the mission. I guess I'm talking on more on the mission requirements. Um, so they're hoping they could do better than that. But 
Yeah, that's the reported number that we're going to see from some of the products. And that's going to be averaged over, um, you know, certain areas required to, to make that measurement. Now, the data itself is going to be a point cloud. And so for a river, you're going to have, it's going to look like LIDAR data. You'll have all these points along the river with elevations that are, again, trying to meet these mission requirements. I think once you do, and I've seen the talks, you do some spatial um, analysis of the of the measurements over reaches, and the goal is to, to do better than that. But that again, that's more just re, you know specifying the mission requirements. Or sp Uh, Kamini Singer, School of Mines. Um, I had a question that didn't really come up in any of the uh, presentations specifically, although maybe Jim is off the hook on this one, um, which is ground truthing. So how do we think about these data? Um, and how, how do we know that what we're imaging from above has validity to people that are thinking at smaller scales? I mean, some of this is the resolution of the instrument, and I realize you can only get so small, but what do, what do you do um, for your respective instruments in terms of ground truth? Or validation. I could go first, I guess. So relative to SWAT, so we're working on the, the CalVal program now for the, the satellite. And so what they've put together is we've got a series of, of uh, three different level uh, of calibration validation sites. So we have, uh, you know, the, the best sites we're, we're going to have are going to be instrumented with pressure transducers all along the sections of the river. Um, they're going to have all kinds of measurements made in situ during overpasses. During There's going to be a fast sampling phase at the beginning of the project. So there's going to be a ton of field work along pretty long sections of unregulated river um, that's going to represent our gold standard in terms of uh, calibration validation. And then we're going to look at sites that have USGS stream flow gauges and some additional beefing up of some of the measurements at those sites for like a second tier level. And then we have down to a third tier level, which would be just more like a, a traditional gauge site that has levels. So again, the three different levels spread across, like it's actually planned to spread them across, you know, globally uh, where we can do these uh, different levels and sort of building that database now. Um, on the geophysics side, it's, it's a hard question because it's difficult to access the subsurface at the depths that we investigate. So boreholes are, are probably the best starting point. You can correlate with lithologies observed in boreholes. Um, a number of the companies um, have standards that they'll go out and measure the same location and ensure that their systems measure at least the same response over a known location. At the USGS, we typically require that they do that at the beginning of the survey. They fly over a short test line where we have some ground truth data, whether that be boreholes or other ground-based geophysics and ensure that the data sets are at least consistent with those. For the inside data, it's actually relatively easy. We compare with uh, GPS data, which is also remote sensing, but does require a receiver on the ground. And we can also compare with leveling surveys that are entirely ground-based. So anything that measure deformation, basically. In say for grace is tough. Uh, they've been going uh, so uh, Calval site where in places where there is no signal to make sure that you don't see signal. We have been comparing in places where they are, have uh, some independent observation, you know, being able to close the water budget or over the glacier, you know, on the ice sheet. We have other independent data that show, and you know, and we look at the spatial variability in the signal. And uh, but otherwise, is uh, you know, we compare with the ground, you know, groundwater well observation. But again, you have to be in a place where you have, you know, that they are, you know, they're measuring the same thing. So you have to have an actually for. But I, I do think that we had, you know, a lot of feedback in terms of our observation to just be confident in, and we try to just do a back of the with a robust error budget when we look at. I, I have a question for you, Isabella. Uh, so uh, uh, Grace measures total water storage. How do you, what's the largest uncertainty in getting at the groundwater component? So I guess it depends what we call groundwater, if you want. So I think that how I see it, I see it that we're looking 
you know, we're looking at the total water storage and then, you know, we have other observation and we try to see, you know, that I guess was part of one example. How can we, you know, we have soil moisture that represent a portion, you know, and so that can we just figure out the way which separate the different component. Uh, we can look at some, you know, surface water. We have like some area where we look, you know, and uh, uh, reservoir, reservoir signal. Uh, we look, uh, you know, at, uh, uh, and so at the end, uh, I think that to really understand, you know, say what is like, a, it, let me ask, what do we call groundwater, I guess? Because, you know, groundwater, so the model, soil moisture is not just the top, that is what I call, soil moisture is like include also the root zone. If you look at what is deep water, uh, is, is, uh, is harder, you have to either use a model, you know, to say, you know, so uh, I guess the approach would be similar to what we did in the case of, uh, you know, we're showing the GFDL model. You know, we validate close the water budget. We look, uh, you know, if when the things don't agree, you know, there, and then we can use that model to look at the partitioning and what is missing. We have a question from online. Um, this is from Prabhakar Clement at um, University of Alabama. Um, and it's for Jim Butler. Uh, what about scale effects of net inflow? Grace data, for example, is such a large scale. How can we interpret net inflow from it? Well, today we've learned that there may be some possibilities of working at smaller scales with Grace and other data. So I think that's kind of what I was getting at. Um, but I'll leave that to others because I'm not an expert on the, the Grace uh, possibilities. Maybe I can. I, I think it depends. So there are like different approaches. You can try to extract the signal. So if you have an aquifer, there is, a, you know, and again, you're talking about net flow, but if you want to look at the, at the change and then you have to account at the change the grace sees again, is the total change. So we have to remove if there is, you know, like some, what is not just, you know, in the ground, but you can, uh, but, you know, again, close the water budget for a specific, you know, drainage basin and, and then, you know, look at other, you know, at other component to make sure to isolate the, the, the component is associated in and out from the ground. Well, can I just respond? I mean, even though uh, Kamini designated me as being off the hook, um, I think this issue of uh, ground truthing is extremely important. And one of the areas that uh, we're working with Ryan and others on is trying to get at remotely sensed um, pumping uh, estimates and compare them to the ground truth of uh, the meter data that we have. So I think that's got a lot of potential. So I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to that work. I have a question for Ed, um, just um, for my understanding of SWAT. So you were mentioning a, a 10 centimeter requirement, but uh, but that's for the elevation, right? And it's going to give, isn't it give you slope of the of the river, and that's a big part of what would be used to um, to estimate the discharge, right? But then my question is, uh, can you apply the calibration of SWAT from one river where you actually have discharge measurements? to another one where you don't have discharge observations. I, it, I'm not sure if those are if it's transferable. Yeah, so the, again, the, I don't know the actual number right now. There's about six, seven, maybe eight discharge algorithms um, that are using these measurements of width, so river with the elevation and the slope. And change in elevation, they get change in area. And so all of them are doing something to estimate some uh, missing bathymetry and then doing something for roughness. And roughness may be static. Or roughness may change with uh, discharge or water surface elevation and discharge rate. And so the product for discharge uh, doesn't have a mission requirement in terms of accuracy. Um, it, it's it's going to be tough to estimate. But uh, because there's so many different discharge algorithms, what we're seeing, obviously, some work better in certain types of rivers than others in terms of how they're trying to estimate these missing quantities. 
So there's not going to be a discharge product per se that comes out that's one number. It's going to be all of the algorithms and the, the, the values that they get for the missing bathymetry and the roughness that you could plug into something like a Manning's equation and have discharge. So for each river, you're actually going to get a whole bunch of discharges uh, for each of the different methods that come from that. And so the studies are really ongoing right now to try to quantify uh, which approaches work better for which types of hydrodynamic situation in terms of, you know, the braided rivers are a real challenge. Um, some rivers have backwater effects. Some are, you know, don't have backwater effects. And so trying to map out all of the various scenarios is something that's getting worked on now. Um, and then, again, testing the algorithms in all these different situations to see if, you know, we can say one works better than another or just use them all to sort of lock in on a uncertainty. Okay. Um, I think we'll stop here and go to the uh, panel session. I'm sorry, I can ask your question.